So welcome everyone. I think we have given five minutes to start and to, to have you all here. I can see familiar faces here. This is an episode of ICOM NPR, one of the committees of ICOM, the International Committee of the International Council of Museums that have been celebrating the International Museums Day. And we have been debating the topic of the Museums Day, the sustainability and well being throughout these webinars. This is a webinar that happens this month. And the next one is going to be in June 23rd. You're going to see on the chat the information to subscribe for the next one. So don't miss it. And this will also be recorded so people can share this information and spread with colleagues in other museums and other organizations as well. So I will explain the dynamics for the day and just introduce myself, introduce Daniel, and then we're going to have 30 minutes conversation. I have prepared some questions with him. We had had a nice chat about how regenerative cultures apply to museums. And then you're going to have your chance to bring your questions, your ideas. You can bring them to the chat at any point because our colleague Luis Marcelo is collecting them to the end. So that's more or less how we work. Um, so first, first of all, I want to thank Deborah Ziska who is the chair of the ICO NPR and all the team of ICO NPR who has been working with us for this to happen. And of course, ICO International that decided to have a focus on sustainability this month. That's why also we are here. And the second you all that came today, because I can see the idea for this workshop was a mixed match between people that work on climate change, sustainability, environmental sector, and museums professionals. I think that's the delightful way of learning about regeneration is joining up these two communities together. And I think they know all being here today make this beautiful thing happening because you can learn from each other. That's the whole idea for today. So let's start. Um, and I just see my colleague here saying, yes, so we're gonna start now. So just a little bit about me, why I'm here. I'm Lucimara Letelier. I am an ICO NPR member. I have been for six years an ICO NPR board member. I'm also an ICO Brazil board member. And I have been working with sustainability in museums in Brazil and other countries as well as a coach at Key Culture. I see some colleagues here, Doug, and also some champions today here just join us. So thank you for you to come. I have been working for 23 years in, in museum sector, nonprofit sector, and I'm certified sustainability uh, guy education uh, trainer. And I have been studying regeneration for some years now especially uh, being trained by the Institute of Regenerative Development in Brazil, which is very much based on the Regenesis Institute um, from the United States. And previously, I worked in different museums. So I was the deputy director of the Museum of Modern Art in Rio and the deputy director for um, the British Council in Rio de Janeiro and the head of fundraising for Action Aid. So basically, I'm very much interested in the topic and now I have a consultancy work with museums, um, specifically on sustainability. So that's why I invited, uh, on behalf of ICO NPR, Daniel Wall to join us today. And I met Daniel uh, when I did Guy Education. He is one of the co-founders of Guy Education, teacher and co-developer of the content that Guy Education delivers in sustainability. And I will tell you a little bit more about Daniel and we invite him to say hello before we go into questions. Mm -hmm. So Daniel Wall is one of the catalysts of the rise in regeneration. And he's the author of Designing Regenerative Cultures. If you don't have this book, I advise you urgently <laughs> to look for that. It's translated in seven uh, different languages um, and throughout seven different countries. And he works as a consultant, educator, activist with NGO business governments and global change agents. He has a degree in biology, holistic science, PhD in design for human and planetary health, 
His work has influenced the emerging fields of regenerative design and especially salutogenic design. We are going to be talking about salutogenesis today, and I think it's very important, this topic. He's a winner of 2021, um, the Royal Society uh, Bicentenary Medal for Applying Design and Service to Society and awarded two years Poland's Fellowship in 2022. You can learn more about Daniel on his um, bio on the link that we're going to post here with his information. But basically, then I want to, to give you a warm welcome before we jump into the questions and just want to introduce this for yeah. first uh, words. Well, thank you for inviting me. Um, wonderful to have this opportunity. And as you can see, Lucy Mara knows a lot more about museums than I do. So I'm going to learn just as much um, in this conversation. And I'm really looking forward to also hearing from all of you. Well, that's great. So we are going to discuss about regeneration first. I think many people have been discussing sustainability, especially the museums community this month, what sustainability means for museums, what sustainable development means. But when we talk about regeneration, it's something else. It's about how we go beyond sustainability and we need to regenerate the territories, we need to regenerate the communities. So my first question to you, Daniel, it's about the concept. What regeneration is about, if you can explain us um, the features and the components that you understand and you tell us about regenerative culture. So first of all, let's talk about the concepts. Mm -hmm. Well, there's, there's so much to say that I, I, I can only name a few things, but um, right now this word regenerative is starting to become popular. And the same thing is happening as happened with sustainability, that when things become popular, more and more people write about it or feel they need to opinionate about it. And what then happens is that you get an increase of noise to signal. You, and for people who come in later, they get really confused because everybody talks about regeneration, but lots of people are actually still in the process of finding out for themselves what it really is, but already writing about it. And that's, to my mind, what's, what's happening right now. Um, and to just put out a few kind of how do I check whether when somebody tells me something with the adjective regenerative in front, it really has something else in it that we might not find in the current approach to sustainability. I would start with things like if people talk in the abstract, some kind of one size fits all um, the 10 steps to achieve a sustainable regenerative museum, the 10, um, the, the, the roadmap to your regenerative museum, eh? then you're probably already not doing what the difference between how people work in sustainability and how people work in regeneration is really focusing on, which is it has to be in a specific place and it has to be with specific people in a specific culture in a unique place-based context. Only when we unfold all the kind of multi-crisis problems that are clearly present everywhere on the planet now into the specificity of a particular place and a particular culture, can we work regeneratively? The, the, if you want to distinguish the wonderful work that is going on in sustainability, and I worked in that field for 25 years and still do, um, it has a tendency to try to define problems and then create conversations about abstract problems that then create abstract solutions for these abstract problems, and then they get implemented in specific places. The SDGs are an example. We're, we're suggesting 17 goals that are the global goals, but really they will only become ever implemented if they become everybody's local goals. But we've not paid any attention to the process of how people in place can ask the question, how are these 17 goals related to us, our place, our history, our future, and this particular place. And so you can work with the SDGs regeneratively, but only if you do that Aikido and make it specific in place. 
for me, that's one of the, the key aspects of regeneration. And the other aspect that is also happening because so many people now talk about it and, and they become, it creates confusion is that because it's new to a lot of people, people are beginning to sell it as something new. And regeneration is actually something ancient. Mm -hmm. The aberration is degenerative patterns in culture. And that's maybe 10,000 years old for our species. The default for a species to be able to survive 290,000 years like our species has is to be regenerative expressions of place. All our ancestors everywhere in every part of the planet were indigenous to place and indigenous to life up until about 10,000 years ago. And they understood themselves as expressions of a particular ecosystem and context, not owners of. And up to that point, we were regenerators. We only survived because we knew how to collaborate and how to bring ecosystems into higher states of abundance, biodiversity and health. And, and I would say, besides yeah. being, um, as you said, an ancient um, characteristic, it's also something that it's very common and natural to the nature, because regeneration is part of all the, the life systems that we see on Earth. So it's part of the, the, the life system, the biosphere, how it survives. What the thing is how we translate that notion of regeneration to the industries, to the fields, to the areas of work that we are working with, right? It's not something new, it's something that exists since nature exists. Absolutely, In, none of us would be here if our cells wouldn't have the capacity to regenerate and have done within the last 40 days. You're not the same person than you were 40 days ago. And we, we're, we're constantly regenerating ourselves on the cellular level, on organ level. Um, we used to think the brain cells don't regenerate, but even that is now uh, disproven. Um, so um, the whole process of regeneration is not something new. It's anchored in life itself. Regeneration is the essence of life's capacity to self-organize and to create higher levels of complexity out of diversification and subsequent more complex integration of that diversity. That's the evolutionary journey that we're, we're part of. And what our challenge as human beings is, and what I think the role of museums to some extent is now, is to bring us back into the family of life, to make people fall in love with their places, to, play, to make um, people understand that the whole cultural discourse that says nature over there, culture here, or culture somehow above nature with technology being other than nature is a cultural discourse that continues a false dualism between mm -hmm. nature and culture. The, 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 the paradox is that only if we embrace even all of technology as a, in many cases, maladaptive expression of nature, not apart from nature, we will never be able to see nature in the right way. The, the Goethe, good, good the, the German poet scientist 200 years ago, said, he who doesn't see nature everywhere sees her nowhere in the right light. And, and of course, the constructivists and philosophers could say, no, nature is a socially constructed con concept. Um, well, then substitute the word nature with life to make it less of a debate. But life is a fundamentally regenerative process, and we're part of it. And the challenge that we now have is to have a relatively short period of time but we, because we've already spent, not all of us, a very few of us, but they've almost started to put life in danger with their behavior. Mm -hmm. Over the last 10,000 years, we've started to push both deforestation, biodiversity loss, and now climate change to a point where the actions of a very few, the global north and the colonizers have actually created a situation where all of humanity and all of life is in serious um, danger. And, and so we, we need to act quickly, but if we act trying to find sustainable solutions through technology and the way that we're currently solving problems, yeah, then 
we're not doing what we're most needing to do, which is to remember that we're part of life, remember that we're expressions of place, remember that our human nature is to be slower in a particular place based on analog human relationships and not virtual relationships. We, we, now everybody talks about AI. Uh, that can only be as good as the intelligence that fed it. And the intelligence that fe feeds AI is the most confused generation in the history of humanity that actually believes we're not part of nature. And then that AI is gonna tell us what to do. That's the perpetuation of the problem. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So we need to come back to natural intelligence, to the, the intelligence of life itself that is in ecosystems, that is in communities, that is in every community that, and everybody caring for something in your community is already part of life's regenerative impulse working through them as life. And that's what that we need to make people re reconnect to, make it more visible, tell the stories where it's already happening so, yes. so people get to know their region. Exactly. And I think this is part of the, the next question about how museums can help. But just, just bringing an idea from what you just said, I think it's important specifically for this community to understand why sustainability is not enough. Mm -hmm. And because sustainability is so spread out as a concept, and we need to understand that it's very hard to sustain the level of planetary resources in the way we are living now. So the living systems that we have now do not moderate or do not comply with the need for the sustainable futures. We need to regenerate in order to recap and reorganize the systems to be able then to sustain in the future. I think this is very important oh. just to, to, to bring about the difference between sustainability and regeneration. Well, I mean, if you want it in economics ter terms, um, we've been on the false assumption that everything has to grow exponentially and we build an economic system that actually necessitates economic growth to not collapse. And that would kill, will kill us if it continues. So we need to do what every biological organism does is that at some point, the exponential curve changes to the logistics curve, which means that you don't grow quantitatively, you grow qualitatively. Mm -hmm. and the only way to do that is to grow into place, into locality, into real human nature relationships in a particular context. Yeah. And then we can grow abundant and rich in that context, but not in numbers on some kind of bank account, but in human relationships and in relationships to place and in story that binds us to place and makes us expressions of it. And that's that's a fundamental shift, and that's why we, we do need to go beyond the current way of working with sustainability, but the, the, the importance is to not make it a sustainability bad, regenerative good, sustainability yes. old, regenerative new conversation, but to say there are wonderful people with wonderful intentions already working regeneratively in the sustainability field, but Please watch out whenever you catch yourself having global abstract conversations about how to solve something for everybody. That is colonialism that is still in our way of thinking that even like people mean it well intended that they, they really want to help humanity, but they're coming in with a strong sort of one size fits all we've got the system we even have the funders now. Yeah. Do what we say that doesn't work it has to be grown out of community and that's again where i think any form of institution that can facilitate not a solutioneering not a what oh we've got lots of problems what are our solutions and create hackathons to create more solutions but a an institution that can hold a long-term conversation of people in place about how do we relate to each other? How do we relate to this place? How has this place and its histories informed us? What is this ecosystem and how are we obliged to it? What does it provide for us? Um, what, all of that, the soil series, the, the, the species. And it is through seeing the complexity in detail in a specific place that we then can use science and technology and all of that to fall in love with a place again. And that's precisely what's needed to survive. We, do, we don't need more technologies to create a um, 
sustainable future that one size fits all a la ecological civilization of the Chinese government. No, we, we, we need diverse regenerative cultures, people in place continuing to live the question of how do we relate to this place? Because it changes. It's not yeah. a solution that you can just make up at the UN and then implement. Yeah. Well, one thing that is very important for museums, as you know, they hold collections, they hold ancient knowledge, they hold histories and memories of people. But I, I want to bring what you mentioned in your article about how museums can act as bioregional learning centers in a global world, but became catalysts for cultural evolution locally. And how does that react and change globally what we are facing now? Just building up a little bit on that question, you nominated this as a collective process of letting go of no longer appropriate world views and value systems. I think a lot of discussions in the museums now is about how museums contribute to build new narratives for more sustainable futures and commit themselves to reframe how they present the information that is needed now to regenerate territories, communities, but first to regenerate our value systems and customs that are very aimed at consumption at the moment and need to be reframed for a new economy, for a new society. So my question to you is to explore the idea of how museums can work with regeneration, help societies to build a more regenerative culture, but specifically looking at what museum can do, can do, considering what museum has as an intellectual property, our museums have local influence and authority in specific topics, but also hold the biological knowledge in specific natural history museums or specific collections and, and research that it's also meaningful for the search of what can be regenerated in degenerated territories. So my question to you is, how do you think is the main uh, point of supporting uh, of museums to regenerative cultures as a means of change and where they are, but also solving global uh, problems that we are facing now? I, I mean, first I have to say I'm not a um, museum professional. so as happened with our wonderful conversation that we had to sort of prepare for this, I, I just learned a lot. Like I learned up until that point, I didn't know that eco museums existed and that there was actually a global network of them, nor did I know that community museums existed. And, and also what you told me then, and maybe you should mention this again, um, is, is the whole difference in how museums approached in the global North and the global South. Because I'm I'm from the global north, I'm biased by my own context. Yes, I've seen a number of countries and lived in the global south, but I I still noticed in our conversation that what came up in my mind when I used the word museum was not necessarily exactly the same thing in what came up in your mind. And I think that's a really important um, thing to to highlight. And in that, I I learned that it seems to me that which was wonderful news that the way museums are already being perceived in the global south as a way of bringing the community together as a way of weaving narratives of, of everyday objects as you told me where where people show something that is meaningful to them in their life day to day and then tell a story around that and and then it's it's a forum where that gets woven into oh, yeah my granny also used to have one of those but it was slightly different and and, and then suddenly you begin to tell the, the story of place and the history. Yeah? But of course, because we're all now a, a diaspora caused by colonialism and neocolonialism and, and all of that, um, it's, it's also this, how do we interconnect the world again through, like you were mentioning, um, collections. Um, I mean, I'm German by birth and there was this whole polemic and uh, almost embarrassing um, difficulty when the, the Humboldt Forum started, because they simply couldn't have, like they could have diffused all of that by, by leading with a decolonializing attitude and beginning the process of even giving back collections to the places where they were robbed, robbed from, or at the very least beginning that conversation of how do our nations relate because of that past of how do we end up with this? It's not ours, it's yours. Uh, and so I think there, there's a lot of 
potential with regard to the now so necessarily decolonialization agenda that museums can, rather than be attacked by activists, which they will be if they don't, <laughs> stir into the skit because this conversation is highly overdue and lead and invite exactly those activists to say like, look, how can we make it better? Invite the, the, the nations where some of the exhibi uh, exhibits have been, been robbed from. And then also always with regard to, because you were asking how can all of this be used for regeneration? I think almost anything can be used as the entry point of a provocation to say, how does this relate to this place? And for me, to a large extent, regeneration is always about nurturing and understanding of how the place sits in a nested system, that, that local to regional to national to global. Eh? And there's a, a, just a shared another short piece that, that tells the story of a precedence of this from over a hundred years ago, where, where Patrick Geddes, um, who was a biologist, but is now credited to also be the one of the founding fathers of the discipline of town planning and sociology. Um, so polymath, somebody who worked across the disciplines. He um, used an old tower right on the castle esplanade in, um, in Edinburgh to create a museum that was open to the public, free for everybody in which people would walk into the ground floor and have an exhibition of the world. And then they would walk one floor up and it was Europe. And then one floor up and it was the UK. And then one floor up and it was Scotland. And then the last one was a camera obscura that showed them Edinburgh. That is the kind of thinking, that nested thinking that we can do as museums to land us always in this, how do we relate to this nestedness in which Everything we do here in this place is not parochial localism in which we're only looking at our local. No, it's a global activity because it affects planetary health. It affects the future of life on Earth. And so what, what, what he did very simply, get us over 100 years ago, is to give every person who did this climbing up and climbing back down an embodied felt experience of where they were on the planet. And... And I think that that already has a huge power in, in then giving people agency to say, I might not be able to change the world, but we together can change this place. And I think that's where, where we need to go with the, the potential that museums have. Well, there are great um, mentions about this on the chat because we have people here who are actually working with this as um, Douglas um, Wurtz, who is my colleague at Key Culture, and he also wrote an article to this book about Echo Museum. So at the end, I will invite him to, to have some comments and questions. And of course, Bridget McKenzie also has contributed a lot to this conversation about the bioregional uh, impact and the biocultural responsibility of museums. So they are posting here on the chats. And I just want to bring the ideas of um, what you mentioned about the eco museum. Of course, in Brazil, we have many eco museums. In Africa, there are tribe museums, community museums, territorial museums, museums that were organized, developed, and managed by uh, people who are from the community. And they're not focused on their collections. They're focused on sorting the problems that they have there and empowering, empowering the community to, to learn about themselves and from learning about themselves, facing the challenge that they have in contemporary issues. So I think the eco museums are an important basis for all museums community, everybody who is here and wants to learn from. Of course, the Santiago uh, Roundtable that was developed at ICOM and UNESCO in 1972 it's the basis for this, Daniel. In terms of theory, the theory of museology, this is where people should learn from eco museums in terms of how this was related to the global community of museums. But this exists from uh, since the beginning. And when we talk about the tribal museums in Africa and how they face the colonial futures, the colonial problems that they had uh, faced um, there. 
So I think it's very important to mention that these museums, um, such as the Eco Museum of Amazon, or in Brazil, there is the Cariri Museum, they are holding back the security in these areas on how to preserve the biomas there. So there is a museum close by here in Rio de Janeiro, which is the Archaeological Museum of Taipu. They have done a participatory inventory that it was basically recapping the fishing in that community as the basis for their economy that was going to be lost because the oral history was not going through anymore from family to the youngers. So I think there's a whole understanding of how museums like that can restore their bioregional um, work, which affects economy, affects the empowerment as citizens of these local areas, and also affects sustainability of the ocean there. So I think there, there, there is many, there are many examples that we could have, but the North needs to learn more from the South, from Colombia Eco Museums, from Costa Rica Eco Museums, and, and, and learn how they have organized themselves and how they affect and how they affect regeneration. I think you're quite right. Um, I just briefly to pick up on that, that the North does have to learn a lot from the South because we, I, I personally love this notion that was coined by one of the, the early American bioregionalists, Peter Burke. He, he speaks about this, like he coined this word, re-inhabitation. And I think that's a really, really powerful um, concept. Um, it means that we're really called to in a globalized world with global awareness become local again come home to place and i think that that process to to do that in this attention grabbing global fast paced um multimedia economy needs a process of patient learning of how magnificent our places actually are were can be again, maybe are still the put, and, and the way to do that is to shine the light of awareness onto what already is. Regenerative cultures are not created as utopian visions of some kind of ideal society and then some backcasting exercise and milestones on how to get to this utopian vision. They're created by celebrating life's regenerative impulse already showing up in a place through people who protect the local river, who protect um, ancient heirloom varieties, who care about single mums, who um, work with teenagers that are excluded from school and make those people begin to see each and every one of their activities, not as, oh yeah, my passion is this plant and my passion is single mums. No, um, it's the bringing together of everybody who cares about um, the regenerative activity in that place, who wants to heal that place in one way or another. One of the, the manifestations where people need support and need to be nourished and need to be provided with abundance is part of this movement. And I think the bringing opportunities for people in place to have this longer conversation, to fall in love with their place again, to, to learn about it, because we, we, our education systems have compartmentalized our minds to the point that we um, believe that we only are good in one or two things, but we will only really understand how to be custodians of a bioregion again, if we're good in many things, if we understand hydrology, if we understand that climate change is not only about the carbon cycle, but it's much more about the hydrological cycle, that it's it's about healing the local rivers and the local patterns of moisture and rain that would have a much more systemic way of supporting the region to be more productive and more abundant. And, and all those conversations can be had in museums, particularly if there are diverse museums in, in, in a particular bioregion, they can all shine lights from their different angles onto that larger conversation. They can create, it was begin to interact in a territorial way 
of saying we we're going to have a circuit where where people can spend one evening in this museum and then another evening in this museum and we weave together what these different museums tell about this place um yeah and i think you you mentioned about the north uh the the, the more classical museums that are in the north but also the museums that are in the south in urban areas that tell the stories of colonization in places like Brazil or in other places, there is a very important discussion of how they can regenerate um, their narratives by looking to the idea of power with instead of power over people. I think this is very important um, message and learning that we can take from eco museums and for communi from community museums is that they're built up from scratch based on power with and not power over people. And I think as a basis of the, the colonial thinking on museums, just by changing this narrative, they are regenerating a lot of the value system that is spread out throughout the education systems because the schools go there and learn so much about this um, histories throughout the eyes of the power over other people and other cultures. And I think just by changing that, we are reframing a whole a way of viewing and perception from the new generations for the future. So I think this I, is one thing for us to think about. Absolutely, because um, in many ways you can tell, and I won't go into detail because we don't have the time, but, but, but um, I mentioned earlier that it's roughly around the time in different parts of the world, so it was different periods where we settled and began agriculture, that we created patterns that were extractive of the soil and not dancing with the ecosystem. At the same time, we also created settled settlements that allowed for social structures to evolve that were not power with, but power over. Because if you're a nomadic culture, um, tending the ecosystem by moving through it and disrupting it, but disrupting it only to the point of bringing it into more abundance and then moving on and coming back a year later and find the place abundant again. Um, you, you're dependent on each other. You, you understand the codependence among the human family and you understand the codependence with this living environment that you brought forth. But the minute you, you, you be, begin to settle, you, you start to lose some of the knowledge of what you're actually dealing with. You start to specialize, you start to build this power over structure. And, and so there is a really deep potential of using museums to, to actually decolonialize our minds, even all the way to the kind of slightly insidious story we tell about progress and development and developed nations and all of that, 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 that is, somewhat saying that ancient indigenous knowledge of people that have lived in place for 280,000 years, or in Australia, it's proven 100,000 years at least, um, is considered primitive compared to technological modern society and an advancement. That is a narrative that needs to be corrected. Um, it, 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 we need multiple ways of knowing. There's nothing defacing about technology and all the fancy things it can do, but it is only one angle into participatory reality of a re relational universe. And if we believe that it's the only one, then we're bound on extinction, that's for sure. We are seeing a very interesting um, project here in Brazil with the Museum of Portuguese Language. Uh, of course, the Museum of Portuguese Language um, in the past had a more um, colonial way of presenting its narratives, and it reframed it completely now because it's working with indigenous communities and originary people on how the language influences our current culture. If you understand that there's different cosmovisions and different ways of working and looking at society throughout their eyes, but based on the language. So I think this is one great example of looking of uh, local uh, issues that we are dealing throughout uh, reframing our culture throughout the originary learning and the, the wisdom that we have from indigenous communities. So before- 
Briefly, because there's, there's one thing that is really interesting there because you mentioned language and the importance of it. And earlier we talked briefly about AI. Um, remembering the power of the technology that is the word and remembering the sacred technologies that have kept us in good stead as human beings, as part of ecosystems for then thousands of years uh, is, is critical. And part of that is also, and this is a real opportunity, I think, in terms of designing new, really exciting exhibits, uh, is the invitation to say, our westernized culture, that colonialized story about the world, is very focused on the thinking mind, on the stuff that is communicated with the written word that is abstract. And if we want to become fully regenerative cultures again, we need to celebrate what that can do, but we also need to reconnect with the three other capabilities that indigenous peoples still use today and all of us use when we're in survival situations out in nature is sensing, feeling, and intuiting. Those capacities have been deeply atrophied. Jung spoke about these four ways of knowing, Carl Gustav Jung, the psychologist. And um, we, we have for most part of our species history relied on sensing, feeling, and intuitive, qualitative, warm data-based ways of connecting with a relational world to help us survive. And then we've created these cultures that are all narrative based within the thinking story of the written word. And, and it has created an abstraction that, that is really, it's, it's, it's needed to heal that in order for us to really step into our full potential again as human beings. And imagine how exciting it would be to really use e exhibitions and, and um, museums as a, as a place where that dance between Okay, this stimulates the thinking mind, but how does this sense feel intuit? How, how do you land the experience that is the museum in the body? Um, I think is something that, that would all, also worth uh, look at, uh, worth being, look, being looked at. Yeah, I think there, there are experiences that artists have provided in terms of uh, deep ecology from mm -hmm. what Joanna Macy says and other um, authors and how museums have worked with this, but especially the artists. The artists have called for that attention of experiencing, experiencing um, deep ecology throughout their artwork, which I think it's, it's, it is amazing. Daniel, before I open to the question, but I'm inviting everyone now to place your questions in the chat um, because we are inviting you to, to bring your questions to Daniel. Um, I think you will uh, join the, the two other questions in, in one. Um, when ICON had this, this uh, month, the discussion about sustainability, there were three goals, sustainable development goals that they were focusing on. Um, the, the, the third, the three one, which is the global health and well-being. The 13, which is climate change, uh, climate action and the 15 life on land. I think a lot of you, you just mentioned about the codependence and the importance of society understand the interdependence, but I would like you to bring a little bit the idea of the salutogenesis, the importance that we understand that our individual health is very much linked with the, the health of nature and the, the health of the territories and the health of everyone integrated. But it's very important to bring that in the context of museums during the pandemics, a lot of museums had to learn that throughout difficult times because they had to close their doors. They didn't have their main, their main active resources, which is the public, the audience coming to the museums. And they had to learn how to work as community centers, even for the health system, because yeah. a lot of vacuums were done and delivered throughout the museums. But more than that, they understood their, their, their health as financial health, um, everything in terms of understanding how the museums work and how their audience health depends on the territory, depends on what's going on elsewhere. This is one side. And the other side is to understand the whole issue of climate change. I know it's a big discussion, 
but it's what make museums move in terms of urgency. Although we have been discussing sustainability for quite a while in museums, what I have seen with museums professionals is when we bring these numbers that 800 million people, uh, more than 11% of global population are currently vulnerable to climate change, and all the other big numbers on climate change also affect museums and make them vulnerable in terms of their collections being exposed to floods and things like that. So then they move on. So I want just you to, to bring the idea of the codependence and how museums should be aware of salutogenesis when they are developing their priorities to work with. Wow, there's, there's a lot to integrate briefly so we can get to questions. And, and, and I'm going to add just one more thing because before to wrap up where we were before, because you mentioned the artists having been um, very involved in bringing the kind of deep ecology conversation into it. I think that's the, an unexplored territory that could be focused on a lot. Um, but again, I'm happy to learn that it's probably already going on and I just don't know enough about museums. But um, the intersection between arts, both the um, performing arts and the, the, the fine arts, and um, whether it's dance, music, theater, all of that, using museums as the backdrop for that and for the conversation of how artists can express the uniqueness of a particular place and that the story of place and its culture in their, their art forms can help museums make even old ex exhibits contemporary again through the artists weaving them back into the current narrative. So I, I just wanted to say, say that because I think that, that we, we should really support the artists as the expression of regenerative culture and, and museums as the platform for the conversation that can create regenerative culture. With regard to um, climate change and the three goals that you have to focus on, uh, for me, that's always a, the, the red um, flag when, when you talk about the integration of 17 goals that are fundamentally interdependent and cannot be attacked with a, these are our flagship goals and then we'll get to the other ones later. Um, they all have to be worked on at the same time or they won't work. And of course, that's impossible at the global scale. It only makes sense when you break it down through the lens of a particular place and region. And then suddenly you work regeneratively with the SDGs again. Like the, the, the danger of the climate change conversation, which of course is urgent. I would challenge you on that statistic, 800 uh, th um, million people in danger of climate change. I think it's 8 billion and rising. We're all uh, fundamentally actually somewhat blasé of how beyond return we already are and how committed we already are to a very fundamentally different world that if we don't use this window of opportunity to have that conversation about re-regionalization and community resilience building, we, we will regret it in 10, 15, 20 years time, possibly sooner. So this is, this is a very, not pun intended, dead serious issue. Um, we're in a world of cascading collapses that we already notice and the sooner we become real about the party being over, about levels of overconsumption just not being sustainable and flying in our face. And also the sooner the ruling 0.1% understand that if we drive that inequality any further, we will also destroy even more in a bloody revolution in many places. Um, and we don't have time for that. We also don't have time for power blocks between different China, US, NATO, all, all of these conversations where one human family in a boat that's sinking and nature will survive somehow much impoverished if we don't do anything about it. But we have a unique window of opportunity to wake up as a species and say, we have a job to do. In this generation of life today, we need to fundamentally redesign the human impact on earth to stop being degenerative and starting to be regenerative. Otherwise we will not have a future. 
And we need to do so not from kind of cushy uh, privilege, but for everyone. And that's, that's a civilizational challenge if I've ever heard one. Uh, so, so for me, again, like rather than distracting ourselves with a race to carbon and global solutioneering around climate change that is, is trying to keep the current system that is fundamentally flawed and, and, and unsustainable alive, we need to build the fail-safe structures of people in place knowing each other again, caring about their region again, knowing where their water, their energy, and their basic needs come from, starting the business opportunities that grow the regional economy again in this slow process of building what, what globalization has eroded, the, the redundancies in the system. Like rather than bigger is better efficiency of scale, no decentralized diverse infrastructure that is tailored to place is much healthier and much more climate safe or, 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 or any kind of um, disruption safe. So yeah, I, I, I think um, we, we will sooner or later wake up that this is a kind of, and that's a terrible metaphor because it's not wartime mobilization. We're not fighting against anybody. It's actually, um, it's just that kind of effort where suddenly everything else stops a bit like you were saying during during the pandemic, where we where we just have to pull together in a certain direction and say, um, we need to fundamentally change not just our way of doing, but our way of being. And we need to create the narrative that makes people not feel panicked about this, but I actually say, this is the way out of this ever increasing mess of like people are just running in even the privileged one, the one percenters are on their treadmill trying to catch up with the zero one percenters. Um, it, every, everybody is stressed and unhealthy. And so to make the loop to solutogenesis and then finally take some questions um, is for me, this notion that just to distinguish what is salutogenesis, um, we have an understanding of health that is um, based on a pathogenic or allopathic understanding of health, which means health is a perfect state. And then you show symptoms where you fall out of that perfect state of disease. And then these symptoms get treated and then you fall back into that perfect state of health. And quite a while ago in the 1960s, uh, an Israeli health scientist, Aaron Antonovsky, after looking at how Holocaust survivors managed to th thrive and be amazing community members and loving um, grandparents and all of that, um, and looking at what gave them that resilience, that capacity to have lived those horrors and then come back, he began to see that there's something about community cohesion and a set shared sense of meaning and a an understanding of health where the disruptions that you meet will mark you and will change who you are, just like the virus changed who you are, changes who you are. But um, so you're not the same again, you're not going back to something, but um, health is more an ongoing learning journey in which you dance with the environment and the things that life throws at you and you learn and build capacity to meet more uncertainty. And that's a very regenerative understanding of health. And, and, and what, what in that, to, because the way that regeneration understands our participation in complexity is with this, this notion of nested wholeness. And that's also very linked to the architecture of health itself, because health is a scale linking emergent property. It links the health of an individual cell to the health of an organ, to the health of an individual to the health of a family, a community, a neighborhood or city, bioregion, and the planet. And all of them are related. You like there's there's now when I wrote my PhD in 2006 um, on design for human and planetary health, people looked at me like I was a bit crazy to even talk about planetary health. But now there's a global alliance called the Planetary Health Alliance that links research institutions, and I think 270 by now, together that have already understood 
that there is a, in terms of health policy, we will not be able to meet the health system demands of the future if we don't create a health policy that understands that we need to heal local ecosystems and we need planet uh, need to heal planetary health. So the, 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 the interdependence in this moment of crisis and impeding cascading collapses that invite us to, to reinvent ourselves is to look at this, how do we heal places? Like the, because it's always people say, what's, what's the one thing that you can tell people to ask themselves whether it's a good design or a bad design, a good decision or a bad decision. If we all swore a um, Hippocratic oath as museums practitioners and says, do no harm huh? and ask ourselves, how can what we do heal individuals, heal communities and heal the planet? Then, then we've got a kind of north to steer on and, and salutogenesis is not just telling people how to get healthy, but is building their capacity to learn how to be healthy, be in right relationship with each other and the community and be right in right relationship with the place that, that su supplies them. Then it was, there's so many and so much to cover that we would like to go over and over about salutogenesis is so important. I was just going to ask if Bridget McKenzie is still with us or I'm not sure if she had to yeah. leave. Yeah. I think she left on the hour. Um, she probably had another call. Oh yes, yes. She just uh, she just left, but she just she just have a question here in the chat. But mm -hmm. before that, I want to open the mic and ask if who wants to 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 do a question now. If you just raise your hand, um, I would invite you to to make a question on the microphone on live because then we could hear if you want or otherwise on the chat. I'm not sure if Doug, do you want to do a question uh, on the mic? To I would love to hear Doug because he wrote me a really nice email yes, and I have not yet. Because Sorry. I'm seeing lots of comments from him. Would you like yeah. Doug to make a question? Thank you. Hi, Doug. Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I'm thrilled to uh, to have a chance to to listen to uh, all of this conversation. It's uh, long overdue, I think, and. Uh, and Daniel's uh, discussions have always seemed completely and utterly been rooted in culture. And, uh, and so for me, one of the big issues is uh, what, what culture means and what contemporary societies have, um, um, have turned culture into. And, uh, and I see a gap between how culture has been institutionalized and how it lives as a living, foundation um, that really supports every every aspect of not only human life but uh, all life as an integrated whole and um, and so for me the question is how do museums become catalysts real catalysts uh, and i think for so long they've been very identified with um, the strategies that they use and not the purposes they're trying to serve and uh, and so we we rely on collections and we rely on exhibits, um, neither of which I think are up to the, their tools, um, but they are not enough um, to guide the process. And so I just wondered if in your reflections um, uh, about the museum world, um, if you had any comments about this business of culture and how it's been institutionalized and and but where where the real problem is in the living culture. Well, um, thank you. The, that's a great question. The, I mean, just briefly, the, um, the title of the book that Lucimara introduced earlier, uh, Designing Regenerative Cultures, actually tongue in cheek has a paradox in it. And, and I do address that in, in the book that cultures aren't designed. And that's precisely what you were saying. Like the way this, the culture has been, been used is sort of to tell people how to be a culture, eh? but, but cultures, are emergent out of the sum total of the human interactions and human more than human interactions in a particular place in a particular context with relationship to a particular history and and all the new incomers and there's there's no xenophobia in in a living culture um and and how do we create um spaces where that kind of learning is possible again like i mentioned patrick geddes earlier and, and and he again i think for gives us a 
example of how somebody, even in the misguided colonializing world of Scotland, um, 120 years ago, could be so foresighted because he started what was called back then the Edinburgh Summer School, which was basically inviting intellectuals like Le Play and Heckel, the guy who coined monism and, um, and Kropotkin um, and, um, to come and have what now seems normal because we're doing it right now, public dialogues that people can come and, and listen to. But back then that was radical that, that intellectuals would sit on a stage where anybody from the city of Edinburgh could walk in and just listen to these people living the questions, not arguing with each other to death about their point of view, but all bringing points of view that enabled then also the public to say, I have a point of view too, and begin the, the, the felt sense of how does my point of view relate to what they're giving, like see it as stimulations. And I think that's precisely what catalysts do. And Geddes started this and it turned into the Edinburgh International Festival and into the Fringe Festival and Edinburgh is still living of a few little interventions that this person made so, so long ago. I mean, he moved into the old town of Edinburgh into the slums to work with the prostitutes and, and lowlifes to do a gentrification of what is now the old town of Edinburgh. And it's, so, so he just understood how important what you were just pointing at, this catalyzing a living dialogue about who are we, how do we relate to each other and this place? What is the uniqueness and potential of this place? How in a globalizing world do we not hunker down and defend ourselves against anybody coming in, but still celebrate the uniqueness of this place and invite others in to celebrate it with us and see it and be seen. So that I think is what we somehow need, need to do to, to catalyze those kind of conversations everywhere. Experimentation I think helps because um, we, we need new tools. Yeah, ab absolutely. The, the, the danger is that some funder tells you um, into like, what's the outcome going to be of this? And, and, and you just have to stir into the skit as saying, that's the problem. When, uh, like, how is it real exploration if I could tell you the outcome now? Uh, um, so, so really invite um, a radical exp a culture of exploration that actually allows us to say, we don't know. And we will never know. And the only way that we can be wise in how to make steps in the face of not knowing and uncertainty, which is just the nature of complex dynamic systems, is to create what you were talking about, create living cultures that constantly check, are we still steering in the right course? And what is the right course? And, and it's this ongoing salutogenic conversation that, um, flips the modern paradigm of show me the solutions and I'll give you the money uh, yes. and says, no, we want to learn. We want to continuously learn. And everything we propose as a project, as a solution, as something to implement, we don't foreground the, the delivery where you hand over the key and see now you have your new infrastructure, your new museum, or now you have your new exhibition, but we foreground the process of creating that object or that exhibition. Or, and, and it's the process, the capacity that that process builds, the human relationships that that process builds, the, the relationship to place that that process builds, that's the outcome. And that's, I think, the shift in narrative that you can use with funders now to say, we're, we're, we're not creating, give me the money and here's the deliverable. The deliverable will live in everybody who's been touched by being a part of this. Yeah. Well, so I, we need I, I, feedback loops too, yeah. Sorry. Just, no, just adding up to that discussion, um, I think the, the field of uh, embracing the unknowing, it's the main assignment for museums because museums is the field of knowing. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> it's about certainty, it's about knowledge, it's about authority. So I think you, you brought out something very important, Daniel. When we're talking about regeneration, it's all about experimentation. It's about really going deep to the questions and not to the answers. 
and museums are very much used to know dancers and being the place of knowledge, which close the whole possibility of learning and going into the community learning and the common learning and, and everything we have been talking about. So I think this is very important for the new generation, for the current generation of museums professionals to open up for questions and, and perhaps leaving space for not having this uh, uh, all the time being the signatories of knowledge and authority and power, because I think this is the essence for change in museums. No, I mean, I mean, leading with modeling humility on the level of what can be known and if somebody is on the right track and, yeah. and flipping that like old position of look, come here and you learn about this culture or this history or this focus um, and say, yeah, we have lots of expertise in this, but what we're actually after is how does this relate to this place? And you have or say in this too how does it relate to you does it relate to you and and really invite people in because then then people will come but if people if you just say them all oh, you come here so you learn fixed knowledge and look at artifacts of then then it's old it's stuffy yeah, yeah. well we had planned more uh 20 minutes for that and it has been a wonderful discussion because doug was great uh contribution that we brought up and I think if you can place on the chat the link for the Echo Museum's book, uh, mm -hmm. because when we have the recording, this will be spread out to different networks. And I think it's nice if you can have on the chat the Echo Museum and Climate Change book that you were one of the authors. So I think it would be nice. Listen, Daniel, uh, Bridget McKenzie, she left a question here on the chat that I want to bring you uh, if you haven't seen yet because I think it would be nice for us to just to hear, you were just talking about funders right now, uh, but just if you want to add something uh, extra to that, she asked, how might we communicate with funders and policymakers about the need to move beyond sustainability towards regeneration and collapse response? And she gives an example of the DCMS in the UK that they just launched uh, a response for the community of museums what she says, the DCMS, it signed its own praise about its mitigation of emissions, seeing this as a total environmental responsibility of cultural organizations. So how would you comment that? I think that'd be... Yeah. I mean, that's that's what, what happens at the moment, is that, that people think that doing good is all about reducing carbon emissions. Uh, and, um, and I think that's part of the... Of course, it is good to reduce carbon emissions. Um, but I mean, that's the other thing that that in when we were saying earlier, what's the difference between regeneration and sustainability? A lot of the way that these people who are now more on the noise side rather than the signal side of, of regeneration um, make it look like regeneration is nothing other than, oh, we've done so much damage. Now we need to do some good and repair the damage. And while that's absolutely true, um, what we are just talking with Doug is really the next step is that it's it's regenerating the capacity of the system itself to heal itself um, enabling the capacity of every single individual to fully participate and give their gifts because there is no other individual like her or him and enabling the capacity of communities and teams to collectively work on something that is beyond themselves and give the, their unique individual capacities to that to then build a collective capacity that it again is unique. That is what regeneration is about, to keep working on people journeying. And, and, and so um, to some extent, what, what, what Bridget's question is bringing up is um, if we think we can still fix climate change by just a technological race to zero, then we come up with those kind of rules. But if we understand that we actually will have to have contingency plans of how to meet environmental disasters and breakdown of supply lines and um, failing of electrical uh, supply systems and so on, then suddenly for a government and for funders or particularly government funders, the whole infrastructure that is in the cultural institutions in the widest sense and, and, and museums becomes a key 
role in like almost like a community learning center uh -huh. mm -hmm. and where the community begins to build the initially it doesn't have to be all oh, the world is ending we all need to pull together it's, it's, it's I, I think it's much more powerful leading with a falling in love with this place leading with every government in the world is promising yeah. citizens participation at the moment well here's a mechanism of making it happen mm -hmm. uh -huh. So calling, I would, if I was writing funding applications to try it from, from these kind of bodies, I would understudy their language and then call them on their own word uh, and say, you want this, you want this, you want this, look at that. What we're doing is doing all of it cheaply and effectively in a way that is actually putting the people in the place first. Yes, but, I believe, I, I think I, I mentioned to you that this week, the Germany uh, government, actually the got the Germany Museums Association published a guide to the Germany museums to how to reduce um, the carbon footprint. And a lot of it is about carbon emissions as well. Uh, mm. And a lot of it, meets, they're missing the point of also the social sustainability and how they should work with communities and change the narratives throughout more uh, the colonial uh, thinking on, on how they treat the communities. So I think there's something there for, for us to, to look at Listen, Daniel, this has been so great. And this is going to be recorded and we'll be sharing for um, museums community uh, within ICOM and beyond that. So one of the things that I was going to ask you, um, and I left here the chat for if anyone has a question, it's about a message, your final thoughts and message and recommendations for museums professionals, because it has been also a struggle for them being requested to be agents of change, to be agents of transformation, when actually they were trained to do something else. They were trained to be conservators, educators, or to work with curatorship. And now we're saying, listen, we are in a crisis moment, a civilizatory change globally, and you need to act as a social agent and agent of change as well. So I want you to give some advice of work uh, professionals who work in museums that would like to be agents of regeneration. What would you say? <laughs> well, we might to give advice, but um, I think if there's so much understandable, like you, you train for one thing and then suddenly you, you have to grow into a completely other role. Um, I think that's a crisis and an opportunity um, in the sense that if museums would actually see that the long-term happiness and meaning of their staff is also about their staff being supported in learning new roles rather than being overloaded and doing the old. Um, and then through that, invent new ways of meeting the public as a museum. So you take your staff through, for example, like the guy education course is a very holistic map of whole systems designed for sustainability. It introduces lots of really, it always comes in in a very kind of from the ground up angle. So it gives a lot of examples on the community and bioregional level. And to then bring, rather than just teach, learn this course, to bring the community together and say, how is this teaching material relevant to us and begin new exhibitions build up around where we learn about alternative currencies or nonviolent communication or straw bale buildings or ecological sewage treatment. And we've done some research and they actually show up in our bioregion in these different ways. And so you begin to map collectively in your learning a, a better understanding of what you're actually working with at the bioregional scale. And then, I mean, they're wonderful courses, for those who, who need to speak the language of economists and, and show that this is already infiltrating even that conversation. The Capital Institute has a wonderful course on introduction to regenerative economics that introduces lots of different people. Um, there are really in-depth learning journeys like Laura Storm's regenerative leadership or, or um, Jenny Anderson's power of place. Um, they're, they're massive open online courses, the one that I helped to co-design with, with ETH Zurich um, on designing regenerative resilient systems. Um, there's, there's now a certificate of advanced study coming out of ETH 
with that theme. Um, then, of course, there's Regenesis Institute that that influenced the um, institute in Brazil, and they they have wonderful uh, courses. Particularly, the regenerative practitioner course is is a real support there. And then Carol Sanford with all her work. So so they, there's a growing offer of people that that allow you to deepen. And the, it's really not about how do I quickly train up so I then can teach other people. It's how, how do I start this journey and, and begin to make our own learning as professionals, um, both a collective team building exercise, a collective visioning exercise, and a communication with others and it, it it all starts with not admitting not knowing if, if you kind of go yes. none of us really know but let's all learn together it it's radical it's fundamentally yeah. radical well i i think I, i'm glad you mentioned some of these courses we are placing some on the chat here because as a museum professional myself when i started this journey of learning sustainability and regeneration i'm glad also i met you and i had a workshop with you about regeneration I think it was very keen for me that I haven't seen museums professionals where we were working with environmentalists. And I think it's very important that they can come along with the courses that already exist. And a lot of them are for free that are related to sustainable development, that are related to regeneration. And you're quite right that it's a journey because I think sustainability and regeneration starts with us first. And we are all the time learning how to be more sustainable, more regenerative ourselves in our lives in order to then keep up with our institutions. So I think it's a long way to go, but we have to start somewhere. So I'm very glad to see here some of our um, champions that I work with at Key Culture. So people from uh, the British um, Columbia uh, Museums in Canada, uh, people from Nigeria, uh, Lagos Museum, and people from Bangladesh as well. So I'm very glad um, that everyone that could attend today. I want to thank you, Daniel, very much, because I think your knowledge in regeneration is very much appreciated, but not always we in the museum sector have a chance to hear you and also to grab some of your attention and knowledge to how we then link this knowledge to the day-to-day -day work of museums which I think we had the chance to do it today. And I hope we can do more uh, exchanging the future with this museum community because they deserve to learn and work with regenerative culture. So thank you very I'm, much. Thank you. I'm, I'm really excited about it. I, I'm just starting my own journey into eco museums and, and community museums. And, and I, like I wanted to set up a bi-regional learning center in the area that like where I live. And I, I think um, maybe, it needs the angle of being an eco museum, um, so so I, I would love to learn with this community because I actually think that um, it's really exciting that there is this global yeah. network. That if we bring that no network into action, as what D Doug was saying, as catalysts, we actually can leverage change, and that's yes. really quite amazing. Uh, so. Yes. Really exciting. Thank you, everyone. I feel like we, we didn't quite ask enough, get enough questions from everyone, but um, we're almost out of time. So, uh, yes, we got, we got some um, and some, I think all of the chat, we have done it. And we have Cecilia Martin here as well. She's from ICO NPR and she's leading the next webinar that ICO NPR will be doing. So make sure if everyone that is interested, you can register before. It's June 23rd. And Cecilia will be um, leading this workshop together with Belle Lavatri, right? And Christiana Casacco. Did I say it right, Cecilia? Do you want to say some words about it? Just inviting people to come. Yes, it will be wonderful to see you all. We talk about uh, hybrid spaces and museums as a place of wonder. So lots of exciting conversation. And thank you all for today. I mean, Daniel and Lucimar, it's been amazing. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's really good. Then we run a workshop together, Cecilia and I, in Prague last year about how museums can be agents of change. So I, I was very glad that she was here. So everyone who can spread the word of this recording will be very welcome. And make sure you can see the recording posted 
on ICO NPR website, ICO NPR um, Facebook and Instagram. You're gonna find it if you want to share it with other people. This will be on the YouTube, as Louise just mentioned. And about my work, if you want to learn more about museums and regeneration, especially in Brazil, I work for Regenera Museu, and you can learn more as well on the chats here on the link is the Consultants for Museums and Sustainability. So thank you everyone. Thank you for this wonderful discussion and I hope we can all be more regenerative in our practices in museums. Thank you, Doug. Thank you, Icon PR. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.